we were we were talking at the beginning or, or before this session. I was like, outcomes and metrics. Only maybe data geeks would be really happy about that. Um, but we're gonna talk about those things, but also focusing on people and the impact that they make as well. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm Kim. Um, I am not from Texas. I spent a lot of time in Texas, not in Austin, but like in Houston and Dallas. Um, I kind of find, found my way um, by mistake in this agile space. I started as a developer in the 90s working in a credit card company. Um, and then I went to a healthcare company. And then I went to an aviation company. Anyone here like highly regulated companies? There's so much fun to do agile things in, right? There's so much fun to build products in. Um, but the good thing is that you know that you're able to make a big output from that um, or a big outcome from that. Um, I am from, Col well, I live in Colorado um, in the mountains. Um, so that's my husband who's an aerospace engineer. My son is a senior at CU Boulder and he's a scrum master because um, he, that's just what he likes to do. Um, I like to get my hands dirty. So I've been to power plants. I've gone into operating rooms where we uh, put Scrum into 48 operating rooms, so that's lots of fun. Um, and there were some pretty nasty things that I got to see there as well. I got a couple of certifications, but you know, that's just uh, badges for me to put on there. And I did get to work with uh, Dr. Jeff Sutherland for a few years, but now I get to work with the fun people at Agile Velocity. So today, uh-oh, this did work <laughs> before. <laughs> Um, that's, it's great, right? Um, so everything worked, of course, before we got started here. We'll see if this works. So today we're going to talk about a couple of different things from a metrics perspective. We're going to talk about Google um, and their heart metrics, and then we're also going to talk about pirate metrics. Can I get you all to give me an R? Okay, good. This is not going to be any fun if you just get to listen to me talk. I will be asking you hopefully lots of questions and maybe you'll get to, to respond as we go through them. Okay, so um, David McClure, pirate metrics. Um, so we said R because this starts off with um, ways of being able to measure how are our products actually performing in the, the space that we're looking for. So the first question is, are we getting people to find out that we even have a product that anyone wants or cares about? Are people able to navigate to the product that we're specifically looking for? Did they find the feature that um, we are looking to build? Has anyone ever built anything and then asked your customers why they aren't using it? And they were like, I didn't even know that you had that in your product. Um, I had a customer once. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had a customer once, and uh, or we were working on a product, and the number one complaint was that people couldn't find some technical documents. And we're like, we've redid this whole thing. We listened to all of these things that you needed and that you wanted, um, but we buried it too deep, and people couldn't find it. So the first thing that we want to look at is, hey, if I build something, can people even find it, whether it's in a product or out there on the web um, or somewhere else? I'm going to put the clicker down because apparently it decided to stop working. Um, no, it's OK. Um, the next one is activation. So not only did the customer um, find the thing, but could they actually try it out? And did they use it? Um, so the first, question, or the first question is, did they find it? The second one is, could they actually use it? And did they have fun doing it? Um, the next one is, did they come back? So the question of, hey, if I have a product, are people coming back to it? Are they starting to use it and reuse it um, again? Um, referral. Um, so anyone have any codes that said, like you buy a product and your, your friend or you get a message saying, hey, if you send your friends here, we'll give you a 10% off or something like that. So we want to look at, from a product perspective, um, how are we actually getting people to find it, use it, engage with it, or um, activate it, and then um, refer their friends to it. And then the last thing is kind of important. Anyone remember what happened in 2000, 2001? What was this uh, thing with a bunch of software that people built? We had, we had companies that were sponsoring 
the Super Bowl uh, commercials with like sock puppets. We had this big dot-com boom. So all of these technology companies were building these products. And maybe they were focusing on some of the things that were up top, but they didn't figure out how are we going to monetize it. And last your name is Mark Zuckerberg, it's really hard to sell to people, hey, I'm going to build this really great product, and we're going to solve all of these people's problems. We have no idea how we're going to make money. But um, so Dave McClure and the, these pirate metrics give us a way to really be able to focus on what is the product that we're trying to build, and how can we start to measure these things? Because maybe the revenue might come later in the process, but as we start to develop small features um, and, and small capabilities, we can say, hey, can people even find it? Are they starting to interact with it? Are they telling their friends about it so that they'll use it as well? And then at some point, hopefully, we start to make money, right? Um, so after the pirate metrics were introduced, um, Google had their own set of metrics. And you know, everyone has to have their own framework, their own way of doing things and calling it their own, their own special thing. Um, one of the biggest things that came out of the heart, uh, the, yeah, the heart metrics from Google um, was that they said, hey, we want to focus on happiness. They didn't feel like the, that was captured enough in the pirate metrics. So are our, co are our customers actually happy with the product? Oh, we could say that maybe that was included. Um, engagement. Uh, adoption, retention, and then the last one. I love the, the little kids in the picture. Did we actually get done what we set out to do? Do y'all use products all the time and you're like, yay, well, we spent a lot of time doing this thing. Um, I was working with a, a group of people that helped maintain power plants. And they were paying these maintenance guys a ton of money. but. We found that half of the time they were doing stuff on the computer, it was taking so long for them to do the stuff on the computer as opposed to fixing the machine. That's not really task success, right? So how do we help to make sure that people come away happy with the work that they've done and that they were successful at what they set out to do um, from the beginning? So this is the uh, participation part of this. So we, I just quickly, very quickly shared. I'm not expecting you to be um, a, a, an expert in these two things. So if we take a look at the heart metrics on the left, the pirate metrics on the right, um, what do you all see? Are there any similarities about these two things? Retention, yes, that's the easy one. So retention, because it's in both of them, right? Um, so are we getting people to come back? Are they continuing to use um, that thing? What are some metrics that might be retention that you all might measure for your products? Yes, so monthly average users, daily average users. Okay, what else is similar about these? Engagement, how is engagement similar? Yeah, okay. Yep, so um, engagement, uh, are they actually interacting with it? And then maybe e either activation or retention, are they coming back? What could be a metric that we might uh, measure for that one, for those couple? Did they use it? Okay. Did they buy it? Did they buy it? Okay. How often are people coming back to the application? So, um, yep, absolutely. Also, uh, how much time do you all spend on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter? Anybody spend, a, like, starting to go in there, you're like five minutes in, and then you're like, oh my goodness, I've spent, like, way too much time on this app, right? So how are we actually interacting with it? Are we, are we just stalking people on those apps, or are we also engaging in the platform as well? Um, what else? Happiness and referral. So tell me about that. If you're happy with the product, you're likely to refer um, other people to the product, um, which is really interesting because they said, well, we created this other set of, of um, metrics 
because people didn't feel like it included enough of that happiness thing. And it's like, well, referral, there's this net promoter score. How likely are you to refer people to it? So that those definitely do go uh, together as well. Um, anything else on which one? What about success? Success, OK, and revenue. Thank you, Eric. Um, so success and revenue, absolutely. Are they, are they saying, hey, I, I got enough done from this product that I'm actually going to pay for stuff as well? Um, has anyone ever had a survey at the end of, of doing something that says, hey, how, how successful was your um, interaction or your engagement um, today with whatever the product is? Um, and then the last one down here, revenue. Hopefully we all understand that. How much money did we make? You could maybe even say how much money are we saving if it's an internal um, product or project as well. Um, so we're going to talk about these couple of um, metrics and how they might apply to the real world. Um, has anyone ever been to the doctor in the United States of America? OK, so you all have some experience with this. Um, this is a case study um, that we were working on. and. Uh, Agile Velocity was brought in to help an organization become agile, right? And uh, we, we get in and we start to understand what's going on in this project. And everyone is really busy. Everyone's super busy. We don't have any time at all to do any process improvement because we're working on this really, really important thing. So we all know that healthcare in, in America is pretty expensive, right? Yeah. Okay. What if I told you that, according to a bunch of different studies, somewhere between 40 and 70% of all people who have a trans an organ transplant failure is because people don't take their medications? What are your thoughts? Why? Why? I mean, you waited in line for however long. You were you know, waiting for this stuff to happen, you've had bad health, like why would you not take your medication? Okay, too expensive, what else? They don't have access, they don't have access to, the, to the medication, okay. Side effects. Side effects. What about not just transplants, but other surgeries? People aren't being compliant or adherent with a the therapy that their doctors are, are telling them to go do. So this healthcare company said, well, we know that we can reduce the cost of healthcare. So kind of turning around that revenue piece. We can reduce the cost of healthcare by getting the members or the patients to follow up and do what their doctor told them to do. Sounds like common sense, right? You went through a surgery, you went through pain, go do what you need to do. So they said, our hypothesis, and that's really small up here, um, the hypothesis um, is that if we can talk to these people and we can have conversations with them that will get people to be more adherent or compliant, and I'll use those two words the same, um, with their therapies. Makes sense, right? So what do really big companies do when they're like, hey, I've got a really good idea, got a really big plan, what are we going to do? We're going to build a system in Salesforce, and we're going to put 100 assessments in it, and we're going to save the world, and we're going to save a ton of money. What could go wrong? What do you think? So what, what could go wrong with that plan? It could fail. It could fail? Why, why would it fail? Lack of proper planning. Lack of, lack of proper planning? Uh, well, it could fail. I, I have to be able to show a ton of revenue or savings because I'm going to put a ton of money into this project, right? Okay. What else could go wrong? Adoption. Yep. Adoption. Actually, even getting people to it as well. So we talked about a couple of these, and I'm just going to fast forward on here. There we go. Um, so. Hey, how many of you have ever told your parents or grandparents, if someone calls you on the phone and asks for your name and date of birth and address, what are you going to tell them to do? Take a hike. Hang up the phone. I'm not giving you my personal health information on this phone call. I don't know who you are. Number one problem with this plan, they could get less than 20% 
of their customers to even answer the phone and get through the validation process. But guess what? I already built 100 assessments in Salesforce, so we're going to be good, right? Okay. Um, oh, what if, hey, I, I actually tore my ACL a couple of years ago. I had to take some drugs that were not good for me. Um, hey, I'm on painkillers. I can't even drive to the doctor's office to get to my follow-up um, uh, uh, visits. Or maybe I live in a rural area and I can't even get an Uber. So how do I actually get to the doctor's office? Oh, but talking to a clinician, a nurse or a doctor, that's going to solve all my problems. I'm going to actually take my medication that's causing me pain and side effects, even though it's a, it's a box of things that I need to take. Um, so they found out that those conversations were taking too long. The big thing is that they didn't really have an understanding of why these patients, these members, weren't staying adherent to their therapy. So we told them to just stop, take, take a pause, <laughs> like stop building all of these things out. If you can't even get them through that first phase, then let's take a step back and let's take a look at our leap of faith hypothesis. So our leap of faith hypothesis, hypothesis, hypothesis sorry, was basically those questions that we had before. How do we get people to talk to us? Well, if we think that they'll talk to us, how do we, how do we um, actually get them through that verification process? How do we get them to go to the doctor's office? How do we get them to uh, take the medication that they need? So um, we actually used the Strategizer platform um, with test cards to say, what is that hypothesis? Um, so on here, we said, our hypothesis is that we can actually get these people who were sick to talk to us. Well, how do you measure that? Well, we can go through and say, uh, uh, so I believe that we can get members to talk or take calls um, from our clinical care staff. To verify that, what metrics are we going to do? So we're going to call the members who have recently been released from the hospital, and we're going to measure how many phone calls we can actually get through personal health information verification and hand it off to a clinician. Why am I going to spend a ton of money building a hundred assessments before I even know if I can do this? So by doing this, we can say, hey, if we can actually engage in this conversation, then we can decide, do we build all of the other things? But the first thing is saying, how do we even know that this first piece of the feature or of the outcome is really useful or needed? Then we went through the process a little bit more. Um, so how can we get them to their follow-up visits? And so we said, not just, hey, are they taking our call, but are we able to measure how many people used our transportation services? So we had to think about, I didn't just talk to them. I didn't give them the information of how they can get their transportation organized. But can we actually validate that they finished that specific task and that they were able to um, get that transportation service um, scheduled and, and follow through with it, okay? So we're, we're going through and saying, how do we measure the smallest possible thing to see, are we making progress? What happens if, if the answer is no? If they say, oh, we're still at 20% of our calls or people are still not scheduling their transportation if they're having transportation issues? Do we just say, okay, well, I give up. We're, we're not gonna be able to solve this problem. What do we do? if they don't actually, if our hypothesis is wrong. Any thoughts? Talk to you talk to the people. What's preventing you from being able to schedule these things, right? So we're looking at starting a conversation with these metrics, okay? Um, I wanna go through one more example of this and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of go, go towards uh, um, some of the other the other pieces. Um, so I, I talked about healthcare. The next one is airplanes. Has anyone ridden in an airplane? Okay. If the product was how do we keep airplanes in the sky? Is that an important thing? Yeah. Okay. So um, in this case, we had a uh, a, a product where um, we didn't have any good data. Literally, we were talking to airlines. We had no idea where their engines were. We had no idea what parts were in their engines. We had no idea what the, all of the diagnostics data was in there. 
So for this one, I'm going to go through the pirate examples uh, and what this looked like. So for acquisition, um, we, <laughs> we had these poor um, customer relationship manager people, and they were basically on call all day, every day. And their job was to manage all of these spreadsheets to try to figure out all of that stuff. But the company had no idea what engines were on which planes. And so the diagnostics data we would maybe even send to the, the wrong place. Um, so one of the metrics that we looked at um, was how many times are we calling um, support as opposed to really being able to have the customer be able to answer some of their own questions. Um, so we looked at how many calls, and then we also looked at what is the, the customer relationship manager's work-life balance. Um, when we got to activation, we said, um, how many customers were able to answer their own questions in real time? Um, so we looked at from the turnaround time of, hey, I have a problem with an engine on an airplane that might be taking off or might be in the air. Um, how much time does it take for me to actually resolve some of those things? Um, so that looked like, how do we increase our sales? How do we have uh, better fleet visibility? Um, the interesting thing was people would take a part off of a, an airplane engine and they would say, okay, here's the part number. And then they would go to the website and they would say, this part hasn't been made in 20 years. Okay, how do I buy the replacement part for this thing? So a big thing was how do we convert from whatever it was that they took off of their airplane engine and how do we um, get them to a thing that they could actually buy so that they could service themselves? as opposed to being able to um, call into a call center or to talk to their customer relationship um, manager person. Um, another one is retention. So are people continuing to come back? Are they just focused on, hey, I have this one problem, and I, I, I went and solved it one time, but it was kind of a pain, so now I'm going to just go back to my uh, customer relationship manager person. So we started to do things like, how many clicks are people having? Um, in the product. How often are they coming back? Um, and our product owners, they got really good at looking at this data. So instead of just having the conversations with the product or with the customers, now they were looking at the data that was all instrumented through our specific products so that we could figure out where were people using things and where were they not using things? And then we asked the question, well, you're not using it. Why? <laughs> What's going on? Oh, well, it was buried too deep. We couldn't find it. Um, but it helped us with having better conversations um, with our customers and with our clients. Um, referrals. So customer service reps, um, they would, in the beginning, they were like, we can't use this product. The data is so bad. Um, it's telling us that this client has engines on this other client's planes or that they're on completely different platforms. Um, but once we started to show that we could show them good data, good information. Then we started to see that they were referring each other to a new product as opposed to the old product that they had used in the past. Oh my goodness, and it was more secure. Has anyone uh, ever gone through a password or a, a new user account process and you're like, oh my goodness, that took so long, forever. And if you're dealing with the FAA, it can get even more complicated. So in this case, <laughs> Um, they found that with the old system that they had implemented, it would take over a month for a new user to get a new account. So I start my job in an airline and I'm supposed to look at how healthy an engine is to make sure airplanes don't fall out of the sky. I'm not trying to make that funny. It's like, it's really important. Um, and so it was such a pain for them to create new accounts. What did they do? They put a username and password on the wall so that everyone could just use one account. And we showed up <laughs> to the client. We're like, let's talk to Rob, because he used the app, he uses the app more than anyone else, the old app. Rob. Well, Rob is everyone, but Rob's been retired for five years. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we can't we can't go talk to Rob. The funny thing was, so that started off a whole nother like set of initiatives and we did all sorts of Wizard of Oz things with a man behind the curtain. 
um, to help people get access to the tools and the systems that they needed immediately as opposed to waiting for a whole month. So we did lots of different product um, tests and uh, worked through a bunch of hypotheses to say, how can we get people the access that they need quicker and faster? And the funny thing is, we got through, um, we had to go through a, a Department of Defense request to change our process. So basically an, an act of Congress. Um, so a huge feat for us to go through that process. Um, and at some of our other places that we do some work, they're like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. That's too risky. We're, we're not allowed to do that from a compliance perspective. And it's like, if I can give people access to airplanes and their engine data, um, we should be able to work through this particular problem. So um, just being able to look at uh, the referral information and getting more people on, getting more people able to use the product as opposed to having that username and password on the wall is, is really helpful. Um, OK, last one, revenue. We were able to turn up our, our revenue for, uh, well, our revenue and then also reduce our costs. Because what happens if your customer service reps who are taking phone calls get less phone calls? They can do other things, or maybe you don't have to hire as many. What about the people who are actually located in the airports and the maintenance facilities? If they're not being called 24 hours a day, how does that benefit the company? Huh? They're focused on their core job. What else? They could be proactive. They could be proactive, absolutely. Another thing. Any ideas? Retention. You mean you want me to be on call 24 hours a day and answer all these crazy questions? And if I don't get them the part that they need right now, that an airplane's going to be sitting on the ground? It's a little stressful, right? So we were able to look at all of those metrics and balance all of those metrics together to say, hey, are we building the right things? Are we focused on building the right things? And does the product include the things that we need? So if we take a look at um, these metrics and take a look at our products, don't just wait for the end. Don't just say, hey, we're going to build this big thing with 100 assessments, and we're going to get people to take our phone calls, and they're not going to go back to the hospital. We want you to do little things and to measure those little things as we move forward. What are the things that we can test out? We also want you to take a look at balancing those metrics. So don't just focus on acquiring people, because at some point you have to make money or your company doesn't really exist. How do we balance between getting people at, um, into the product, getting them activated, um, all the way down to the, the point of um, making money. Another thing is, it is a system. And um, all of the systems thinkings that are out there, systems thinking talks that are out there, A plus B does not necessarily equal C. There's lots of things that are going, in in our, uh, going on in our complex systems. So taking the data and then asking the question, OK, what does this data mean? Does it mean that customers actually don't want this, or does it mean that there's another problem that we haven't necessarily thought about or addressed? Um, we also want to look at leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Now, can anyone tell me what's, what's the difference between those two? Early signs versus afterwards. Um, so my, my favorite example is uh, Elon Musk and Tesla. So for the Model 3, what did he do as a leading indicator to say, will people buy my car and should I build this gigabit factory? Pre-orders. Pre so he didn't even build the car. He didn't have a way to build the car in a factory. But he listed a, a, a site that said, Give me $1,000 and I will give you a car at some point, someday in the future. Was that successful? Yes. It was a huge leading indicator to say, yes, you should go buy and build this product because there are years and years worth of backlog for us to be able to figure out, should we go build this product or should, should we, or we do want this product. Whereas the lagging indicator is looking at 
in the past to say, okay, how much did we get in sales? So what is the thing that we can actually pull together? So wherever possible, we want to look at how can we look at the leading indicators? What are the things that will help us to predict what will happen um, in the future? Um, but I encourage you to look at these different metrics to say, how can you look at your products? And how can you test these things out to say, how do we get people into the product? How do we get them using the product? Are they referring it to their friends? And hopefully, are we making or saving money from this overall product? Okay. So we've got uh, 10 minutes, right? A little bit more. Okay, a little bit more. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, tool, um, uh, this model that we call Path to Agility. Um, and so in Agile Velocity, one of the products that we have is um, uh, path to Agility, and we really start off with what are the key business outcomes that we're looking for. So from an Agile transformation perspective, we're going to talk about some of the things that are up here. So we have speed, market responsiveness, quality, customer satisfaction, productivity, employee engagement, predictability, innovation, and continuous improvement. Have we talked about any metrics that would maybe measure some of those things? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we did, absolutely. So are we responding to the market? Are we getting things out there? Um, are, are people able to, are customers happy with the work that we've actually been able to do? Um, all of the things that we talked about from a product perspective in those metrics, if we're hearing those things and we're hear, getting feedback from our customers, what does that do to our team's level of engagement? If they know, go ahead. It increases. Why does it increase? It increases because we engage with the plan and we actually understand what they want and we're in alignment together. Yeah, we're engaging with the customer, with the client. We know what they want and we know what they don't want. But if I can hear from our customers and I know that people are using the product that I'm working on, we're definitely going to increase that overall um, uh, customer or employee engagement. And we definitely have a problem with that right now. So um, as a path to agility product or the, the tool model that we use, um, we look at the team, the system, the team of teams, and then also the organization. And so one of the things that I just wanted to, to drill in a little bit here is product value management. Um, so this is something that we added into path to agility um, in April, in the April timeframe. Um, and so all of these things that you see on this map, um, these are the agile outcomes that we have. So looking at things like, do we have a compelling purpose? Do people understand why we're building the product uh, that we're building? And do we have um, uh, visibility to the work that we're, we're doing and creating? Um, so there are two, two different cards here that I want to show. Um, and this is just to give you some idea about how we think about uh, transformations and how we look, about, uh, at, look at some product things. So in our process, um, we have a couple of different um, cards that are up here. So product value management. Um, and it says, there's clear product management responsibility established and customers, uh, customers and stakeholders are engaged with partners in sequencing the work um, with ongoing evaluation and product success. So leveraging those heart metrics, um, leveraging those pirate metrics, um, we're saying what are the most important things? Are people using the tools and the products that we're actually coming up with? And um, there are some things down here that we've already talked about. So are customers successfully using our product? Are we looking at things like the heart metrics and the pirate metrics? Are we looking at leading and lagging indicators to make sure um, that we're building the right things and the most, uh, most appropriate things? Um, so um, I'm really fast today. I did this uh, talk about an hour, like for an hour, um, the last time I did it, so I'm, I must have been really fast. But anyway, so <laughs> the point today, um, I want you to think about measuring the work that you do. Being able to show your organization um, that we are making progress or that we're not making progress. Maybe it is that we need to kill a product that we're working on. Um, so leveraging the heart metrics and the, the pirate metrics to say, are we on track? Because I would rather know after a two week sprint or maybe after a quarter that I'm building something that our customers don't want, that our customers don't need, 
as opposed to building out 100 assessments and spending a ton of money on a, on a product. Um, and when we do that, we can actually make a bigger impact in the world. Our customers are, are getting their problems solved. Our employees are coming to work, and they're much more engaged in the work that we're doing. Um, and our team gets to see the impact that they make every day. So they're going to come into the office and, and be much more engaged. And you can course correct um, if, if your hypothesis is wrong. And we already talked about um, not just going with the numbers and using those, but having those start as a conversation. So with that, um, I guess I was, like I said, I guess I was excited to be in real life with you all people. Um, I have not had the opportunity to speak at a conference in real life since COVID. So what questions do you have or anything on the, the metrics or the case studies or anything else that you all want to ask about? Yes, and I'll get the mic. I, and then just the, the mute button. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just want to say, last year I talked about stability. Uh -huh. One of the things that I mentioned was that the business outcomes that you just portrayed to us right now, it's very good. But I had an issue going through uh, stability that they did not identify some metrics that we can use to see if we are meeting those business objectives. But after this presentation, you're starting with those metrics. It really gives me an overview of how we can go about determining what business objectives we want. And secondly, what we can consider as measurement. So I really do appreciate it. That's all I have to say. Well, thank you. I don't know if, you, did you all hear that? I totally did break this microphone. Oh, no, or. Fine. Or it was already broken. I don't know. We'll see. OK. Is this? Yeah. OK. So who writes the business outcome? Oh, and Path to Agility? Or? Just, well, well, who do you, maybe? Who do you recommend okay. work on the <laughs> outcome? How do, how do you write this? That, that those people? OK. So if I'm working on a product, the, uh, so the question is who writes the, the outcomes um, for whether it's Path to Agility or, or a product in general, right? Um, so who, who can have ideas? Everybody, Everybody right. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I, I like to use, so I showed Strategizer. I like to also use Lean Canvas because it has key metrics on there as well. Um, so from a, a metric perspective, most people will say, yes, it's the product owner or the product whatever person who is responsible for doing that stuff. But everyone has ideas. How can we actually do this stuff? How can we measure what we're going to do? Who has those ideas about that stuff? And then actually putting some of that stuff into our team's definition of done to say, are we instrumenting our products so that we can measure those things? Because if you try to do it after the fact, then you know, have fun with that. But uh, otherwise, you're just reporting on people who are self-reporting their metrics. But I think to answer your question, yes, it's the responsibility of the product person, but anyone can come up with those ideas, and we can share and measure those. Wouldn't it be good to have, say, software developers, solution architects, and all of them? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. The customer and the product manager? Yes. Agreed. That's a question. OK, I'll do. You and then I'll go to the back. Yes. Uh, I just want to add to that, Ryan. We had a situation where we, we had a situation where we decided that we're going to come up with metrics for the team. It actually failed because we rather said, as a team, as a collective, what are the things we want to identify as we're going to use to measure what we are working on. So when everybody became part of that assignment, we now took responsibility. So it was part of our definition of that. So it's the responsibility, perhaps, of the product owner. But it's recommended that you should do it in collaboration with the team. Like, can I get an amen up in here? Uh, so someone said, oh, yeah, you're, that's like an evangelical church. I'm going to the back, yes. So if you have team-level metrics, yes, have the team involved in those as well. Um, we definitely take the approach of bringing in what is the problem you're trying to solve. You 
use this instead. Hi. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And we collectively meet as a team. And then what is it that we're trying to impact? What is the outcome we're driving towards with through the lens of what is the actual problem? And do that together. And we include our product management team um, and the key stakeholders mm -hmm. to ensure that our definition of ready is understood before we even start to build. Yes. So understand the problem. Do we know what the problem is and are we going to be able to solve it? So uh, one comment, uh, the clinician thing where we had people who weren't being adherent um, or compliant with their therapy. Do we think that um, having all of these clinician assessments going through the assessments, is that going to actually make people more likely to be adherent? Well, that's a good hypothesis, right? Maybe. So we test a couple of those things out and see, are we actually getting people to follow through on some of those metrics that we could follow? Guess what? If you tell someone, hey, I have an assessment and there's 100 questions on it, it was something ridiculous, like it would take a half an hour. Do you think that people are going to stay on the phone to answer those things? I don't have time for that. So the question is, OK, if they're not willing to do this many questions, what is the smallest thing that we could do to make an impact? Okay, It's interesting when I talk about the, uh, <laughs> that case study, people are like, what? They went through a transplant, and they, they didn't take their, their medication, or they didn't go to their doctor's office? Remember, start with empathy. What is it that they're going through? What are the problems that they have? Right? It's not just, hey, well, that seems silly that they wouldn't stay adherent with their stuff. Ask the questions. What's causing those problems? How can we do some small things to help move the needle? Sorry, Rez, she's not here. Okay. What other questions do we have? Monetization. So, Monetization. Yeah, so when you think actually in both examples, when you look at it and say, okay, when you got down to, hey, we're getting the results, or are we getting the results, or people are being compliant, how did, how did you guys approach monetization at that? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, or, or something else. So the monetization on the healthcare one, um, uh, we, we left because uh, a for a couple of different reasons. Um, but the big thing was that they, they had spent so much time and money on implementing a system that they were in that cost, uh, sunk cost fallacy, um, so they weren't willing to, to pull the plug, right? Um, my understanding is that uh, later they did end up going through that, but if you're not starting to see that you're seeing the monetization, in that case it was cost savings, um, then you've, you've got to ask yourself, like, hey, should we be doing something different? Do we need a different approach? On the uh, aircraft engine one, um, that one was pretty easy because we could connect. Um, we, we did a lot on metrics and we found out, hey, if I'm trying to buy airplane parts, uh, we went through, uh, everyone has used some sort of e-commerce tool, right? Amazon or something, right? So <laughs> we went through this whole process and trying to work with the product owner um, for that particular one, it was like, well, I have to look up a part that doesn't exist anymore and get them to the current part. Then they need to buy the part, and then they need to um, you know, have the updates. When, when is the part showing up? We found that we could connect the first two. The second part of buying the part would have cost us a ton of money to build. And when we looked at it, none of our customers could actually use that feature because they all had to send purchase orders through EDI and through a separate transaction. So we were going to spend a ton of time and money working on this feature um, when it wasn't going to provide much value. So we started to look at from the monetization perspective, OK, we've got less calls coming into our customer service reps, but we're seeing that the parts are actually going up. So we could track the, the customers who were logging in, searching for parts, and we could see that they were making um, sales and transactions um, for the parts that they had searched for previously. So um, we, like I said, the product owners had to do a lot of kind of analytics to say, are we seeing that the outcome here versus here? Okay, I got the red X, so we answered questions. 
Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming and listening to my talk today. Um, I hope you have heard that I'm like pretty passionate about this particular topic. So let's measure things. Let's make sure that we're working on the right things because you all have more important things to do than work on stuff that no one is going to use. So thank you for your time.